Thank you everyone for being here. I'm going to to present in English because my, my French is still in the in the process. Uh, so thank you for, for the, the introduction. It's a pleasure to, to be here today talking about uh, a bit of my research. Uh, as Bernardo said, I'm from Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul at Porto Alegre, south of Brazil. And I'm now doing, a, I'm in a sabbatical, I'm doing a postdoc at the ENS here in, in Paris. And what I'm going to present you to you today is, is part of, uh, of my research that I've been developing since my, my PhD, which is the more macroecological part of it, uh, about patterns of richness and also morphological disparity for rodents in South America. Then I'm going to display patterns of diversity, geographic patterns of diversity, which regions we should expect to see more rodent diversity in South America, and also another part, which is disparity, how phenotypically different these rodents are in South America, especially. So a short introduction about what are rodents of South America. We have three major uh, radiations or monophyletic groups of rodents in South America today. The oldest one to here, hope you see my pointer, are the caviar morph rodents, which arrived between 30, 40 million years ago, very likely through transoceanic dispersal for, from Africa. Then sigmodontin rodents, which I'm going to speak uh, a lot more because I have a lot of morphological data. They arrived in South America via dispersal from North America a bit before the closure of the Panamanianissimus. They are today the group of uh, highest richness among the three. And the more recent and a bit less diverse group in South America, which are the squirrels, which arrived at, uh, about five, six, uh, seven million years ago. So considering these two groups, we sh so sigmodontins have about 430 species, cavamorphs about 250 species, in living species in South America today. I have a rich, a rich fossil history for cavamorphs, not so much, but a bit for, for sigmodontins as well, but I'm going to talk about living diversity. So these are the patterns of rodent richness. In 2015, it came this book, Rodents of South America. So Bruce Patterson and I uh, compiled the range maps, the geographical range maps, and constructed these metrics of incidence for, for rodents occurring in half degree cells across South America. So the A, the A map is the rodent richness. We can see the more red colors, the peaks of the verse are concentrated along the Andes chain of mountains in South America, which are here, mainly northern Andes and central portions of the Andes. And then we have another peak of richness in the Atlantic forests of South America. And in general, the lowlands of Amazonia and the Cerrado, open areas of Brazil, have uh, also great richness of these rodents. And this B map are the turnover, which is a better diversity measure of turnover for, so what it does here, what we calculated here is for each cell, the difference in composition in the similarity of species identity between each cell in each of its eight adjacent cells. So the average of the distance in composition in the density of species for each focal cell to its neighbor cells. So if it's red, it means that this cell have different neighbors in terms of species composition. And you can see that most of this turnover is concentrated along the Andes chain. Of course, something we expect. Uh, so if we have high richness, that's because we have different species, then we expect this uh, difference in turnover, but we have also like this region here, not so much richness, but a lot of turnover and other regions in the east of South America as well, which display high turnover and uh, some other regions in blue here with not so much turnover. This is for 
the two groups combine it, so excluding the skewers, which are, are, are a few species only, the, the bulk of, of the richness are displayed here. And because mammals in South America compose uh, a little more than half of mammal species, you can expect that the mammal species resemble this pattern as well. So for each group separately, so we'll have sigmodontin rodents here to, to our, our left, and because they are much more richest than richer than Kevamarfs, the general pattern, the sigmodontin pattern resembles the general pattern, so this big peak of diversity in the Andes and in the mountainous regions of the Atlantic Forest. Here is the turnover map, and these are some exemplary species for, for each group. And then here the Kevin Marfs. So in Kevin Marfs, we can see that not only we have more species in the Northern Andes, Central Andes, and in the Atlantic Forest of South America, but we also have uh, peaks of regions in lowland regions, in lowland Amazonian regions here, for example. So that's the big, biggest contrast between these two, these two groups. Uh, this is to give an idea. So Sigmodontins, 430, 450 species. Uh, they are much more rich than Kevin Marfs, basically uh, everywhere except these lowland region, region, regions here in, in Amazonia and here in Caatinga and a bit of Cerrado of Brazil. Uh, where so this is this is not this is geographic overlap of maps, right? This is not really co-occurrence. I may use the word co-occurrence here during this talk, but it's not like a small scale co-occurrence de, de facto. No, it's just geographic overlap of range maps, okay? So if you sum geographical overlaps of range maps and you got one group mi, mi, richness minus the other, then you got sigmodon teams basically mainly more rich in the Andes and, and Atlantic Forest and Kevin Marfs in lowland Amazonian regions. And then this key graph is the 25% most richest uh, cells for both in black and for sigmodontins in blue and, and this Kevin Marfs in lowlands here in red. And then we search for environmental factors. We got a lot of uh, environmental and topographical factors in case of elevation here, and we try to see we did model selection to I see trying to find the variables most correlated with richness. And in fact, very few variables are correlated with richness. You got overall low relationship for linear and, and polynomial uh, graphs, but to have a few variables standing out, Mean and elate, mean elevation for sigmodontins and mean temperature for cavomorph rodents. This is just to show you this, this is for, for rod and richness combined. Longitude, it is two peaks of richness here are the Andes and here are the Atlantic Forest. So you can see here that there is an imprint of elevation for both groups, but also in these high elevation regions, we have uh, many of those grid cells with few of small species richness. That's why the relationships are not net linear. For instance, here you have sigmodontin regions in elevation, and you have a lot of yellow cells here, which is, are basically this yellow here in the west coast of the Andes, more arid regions where you have high elevation, but not so much richness, so few richness. So yeah, so elevation yet among the, the other environmental and topographical variables stand out are the best for sigmodontins, while not good, best. And for cavomorphs, it was average temperature of each uh, cell in the present that was the more correlated with cavomorph regions, although, as you can see, there's a lot of scatter in this graph. Okay. So th these are the patterns of diversity. Now I'm going to focus on sigmodontin rodents. And we started to look later to morphological variables and in space in this macroecological context of assemblage. First thing we did, the most simple thing we could possibly did, we just got average body mass values for species. So the average for species in the literature 
And then we just calculate the average for every for all the species whose range overlaps superpose or overlap in, in a single cell. So there are three species, we calculate the average of uh, the assemblage size, the average of size of these three species. So that's the pattern we got for sigmonitin. So uh, we can see a latitudinal gradient here, but the biggest species, the biggest average for, for assemblage here for these grid cells are close to the equator and moving south we start to get the smaller body size value. So kind of the opposite, for instance, of Bergman's rule. Of course, we are here in another scale. We're not talking about populations of a single species, about talking about average of species in the average of uh, species occurring in each assemblage. So this is the, the pattern uh, we got here, which is Close to the, the also if you if you look at the, there is if you, uh, at least one paper with average of memo good size you got a similar pattern of course then because rodents compose a lot of the diversity of mammals in general but then we talked about doing something more more finite so we got this database about body size and not only body size but we got a database about a lot of uh, phenotypic variables usually categorically broad variables. But we, we, we hardly, we seldom have like this, this really uh, these in macroecology variables that are really, really refined, like measurements of schools. We, we hardly see that. So we thought about doing that. And, and I did that for, for my PhD. So I went to scientific collections around the America, uh, the American continent. Mostly of these species are provenient here from the Field Museum of Natural History, where I spent part of my PhD, but also other seven scientific collections. And I measured these specimens, uh, 2,877 specimens from uh, geometric morphometric, that what I got in the end. So this is the school and manual, what I measured here are the landmarks, uh, 2D landmarks that I put on their schools and manuals. Uh, for a total of 239 species, which is a bit more than 50% of the total diversity, but uh, uh, in terms of generic diversity, much higher, more than 80% of generous cover it in this sample. And then with this data, uh, we did a bit of uh, macroecological analysis as well. First, same as for size, the simplest thing, simple thing you could do which is just map the average shape. But in this case, it's a multidimensional variable because we got a lot of landmarks. So we got to represent it uh, in a map with some sort of dimensionality reduction. Uh, reduction. That's why we use it a PCA. And what's represented here is the PC1 of shape variation for school in ventral view, school in lateral view, and mandible. And you can see uh, this is the average shape for the negative values, the blue values, and this is the average shape for the positive values. So you can see here the school in the in the ventral view. And you can see, uh, of course, first there is a similarity between the two school views, which of course we expected. It's the same structure, only different views. And of course, there is also a correlation. We expect a correlation between uh, a close related structure, which is which is demandable. And we got that here. The color, so the, the which is blue, which is which is red, that doesn't matter. What matters is is the direction. So this the special, the geographic pattern, and it, it is the same, or oh, more or less, not, not exactly the same, but it has a, a great level of similarity. We've got these blue regions more related to negative values, to this shape, and so mainly this B, Amazonia region, not only Amazonia, the beyond, but it's northern regions of South America, and more southern regions, we have different, a different uh, shape, we have shape more associated with this negative, uh, of, so, pardon, sorry, this uh, positive values of, of the PC1 here. So this, this is the overall pattern. So uh, again, environmental, possible environmental correlates 
to it and you got two that stands uh, stand it out temperature seasonality here we can see like it's very very similar uh, variable and the type of of eco region of south america so here most seasonal region mostly open regions of south america we got this shape here for uh, ventral lateral mandible and more closed, more forested, least seasonal region, more forested region, this different shape. So this was pretty much a pattern seeking kind of study. It is an exploratory study, but yet we can see a few things here that stands out as, as interesting. Uh, for example, this is the tympanic bulla. So this is this is structured here. You know how familiar we are with rodents. So we can see that this tympanic here is much larger, uh, relatively larger, uh, relatively bigger than the tympanic bulla for, for rodents in the least seasonal region, which is very smaller. So biggest for open, here is barren vegetation areas, uh, smaller, a bit smaller for forested regions. Uh, this makes sense because we know that rodents, because of papers in other regions of the world, rodents in desert areas usually have relatively bigger tympanic bullets, which is thought as an adaptation for avoiding predation to hear sounds better and then avoiding predation, which is particularly important in this open, in this open environment. So more seasonal regions here in South, of South America, we've got more grasslands, more open visit vegetation areas, and it makes sense to have relatively big tympanic bullets. And there are other particular aspects of the school as well that uh, stands out here. So this is this is capturing something something relevant, despite the, those are average. So we got average of shape for each species. Don't know if I uh, I told that. So we have the median of ten skews measured for each species of those that. We had, of course, for uh, some species, much more sample, but for, for some higher species, rare species, we got like one, two, three individuals. Calculate average shape, then we calculate the average shape for the species occurring in a sample. So it's the average of the average, but still this is capturing something that really seems to be something real about, about these patterns of uh, of average school shape here. And of course, when you are in this scale, we cannot forget about a uh, possible role for phylogenetic niche conservatives. So when you look at, for, for example, these are, are maps of phylogenetic composition. Uh, this is uh, an NGA vector, like a, a, a PC1 of phylogenetic composition. So we can interpret this in terms of phylogenetic diversity if you want, meaning that all the blues have species more similar, phylogenetically similar to each other and very different, more phylogenetically distance, distant than the red, the red cells here. For instance, here you have a tribe, a tribe of sigmoidins which are the origin, which have highest richness in the Am this Amazonian region. They occur in other regions as well, in, in some of these red regions here, but this is frequent. So most of the, their diversity is in the blue regions that what this, this map says. And of course, we can see that it's also highly correlated with the average shape. Uh, so we've got this, this thing about phylogenetic niche conservatives here, meaning that, oh, the, these guys here in these blue regions, they have more similar shape because they all uh, belong to a single tree of sigmoidin team that diversified apart from others, or is it because of environmental virus? Of course, probably it's because of both that was our conclusion in the end. So there is a bit of environmental influence. We can see for the symplanic bullets, for instance, that makes sense. But of course, there is also an effect of niche conservatives here, which trees occur in each region, which is, which is relevant as well. Okay, so this is average shape, and later last thing we did uh, was look at size and shape disparity. So now we're not talking more, more uh, uh, again about average of size and shape, but difference between the 
size and shape for a species occurring in a, in a grid cell that we have. So here we have phenotypic disparity. We use this raw phenotypic disparity, which is the pairwise similarity, the average pairwise similarity. So a couple of difference in size between each species occurring in each assemblage and then got an average. This is pretty much what's, what raw is for presence absence data, which is we got. So blue regions more different. These species are in terms of size. So here we are using school size specifically, not overall size, but it's supposed to be correlated. And the blue, meaning these species are more similar in terms of size. The average size of the species are more similar to each other. And then you see a pattern where we have this center of South America here, plus the East Coast, plus the Northern uh, Andes, the Andes to the, to the North of South America, which have a uh, higher size disparity. And then, then for shape, we did the same thing. We calculate the average pairwise par difference between each species occurring in each cell and then calculate an average of this difference. So we have red species are more different in terms of shape. Blue regions species are more similar in terms of shape. A pattern somewhere similar. So we got this uh, and this chain here, we can see that's a bit more red, and the East Coast of South America is a bit more red. And here in more lowland regions, we got less phenotypic disparity, and here in the South as well, a bit of less phenotypic disparity. This is overall raw phenotypic disparity. One thing that's interesting, of course, is that it's supposed to, to be a correlation between this disparity and species richness, which is what we got here too. This is for shape, this is shape disparity, but we got a similar pattern for size. So this observed disparity here in, in the vertical axis is for dot is a cell, is, is a grid cell or an assemblage. And then you have species richness here in the, in the horizontal axis. And you can see that there is a, a linear at some point, of course, a saturated relationship, but it's, it's an increased, more or less linear relationship for uh, each species you, you, you put more in, in a cell, we got more phenotypic disparity and more phenotypic disparity until more or less 20 species richness. And then we got a saturated relationship from 20 species on in an assemblage, Remember, we're talking about geographic overlap, but still at, at the macro scale, that, that makes sense. So if you got more than 20 species overlapping the range size in a single region, you got no more increases in phenotypic disparity. This pattern, if you look like at the paleontological literature, when folks are doing a lot of studies in disparity, we got similar, similar patterns to which we observed here. The, the, the saturated relationships start uh, at 15 to about 20 species, which more or less what we get here. So this is interesting. And then uh, next question is, uh, there's a way to kind of control this species richness and see which regions have more disparity despite the influence of, of richness. And that's what we did next. We calculated this relative size disparity where you use it, uh, new models, use two new models, one completely random new model, which is this one, meaning we just randomize the species label, keep it richness for each assembly, each assemblage, each grid cell intact. So we are controlling the richness, but we randomize it species label at, at random in the phylogeny. So uh, an assemblage could have uh, a species completely unrelated to it and use it a bit of more restricted restricted new model here to the right, where each species could not be uh, changed by any other species, which is a bit unreal. But in this, in this case, he could have the same shape or the same size uh, uh, as would be predicted by a trait evolving under Brownian motion, supposed to be neutral evolution occurred, uh, along the phylogenetic tree. So it would have its shape or size more or less close to uh, 
closely related evolutionary closely related species. But the two, and then use these new models to calculate these standards that affect size for despair, where we got uh, these positive and negative sides here. So positive red, we have more disparity in this case, more size disparity than expected by richness in that cell, and we have the blue meaning less phenotypic disparity than expected by richness. So a bit a close pattern to the to the raw diversity actually. So we have these east coast, both Atlantic forest and here more more grassland areas of South America, the central portion of South America and, and northern and is here with disparity than expected by regions and other regions in the south in, in, in the north with less disparity. Oh, and, and these in these smaller graphs here are the p-values. So red p-values, more disparity than expected under p0.05, and blue, less disparity than expected under p0.05, and no color means no, no different than expected by, by richness. So this is the pattern for, for shape, and the two new models are pretty much, uh, they agree with each other, of course, this is one is more were restricted still. And then you have shape disparity. And now we have a different pattern. So look at the, the uh, how much red you have here for size. So we have a lot of uh, cells with more disparity, more size disparity than expected by richness, but that's not the case for shape. So in case of, of shape, so this is shape uh, from geometrical morphometric. So remove size variation here. This is only the shape, the, the geometry of the structure. And you have much fewer cells uh, where you got more disparity than predicted by, by richness. So it seems like the shape in this case is more, uh, is more restricted variation than, than size across, across your geography. And you have most of South America we, in the blue, so less disparity than expected by richness, to the exception of the red cells here, which are mostly concentrated in the Atlantic forest. So in both cases, so same both new models here, here is, this is more random, completely random, this is more restricted, so have fewer, fewer yet uh, red cells, but still some. And mostly our, uh, the p-values are, are not even, uh, are, are le less than, uh, we would expect uh, for region as a lot. And uh, not color and in blue are concentrated here than in, in the Atlantic for more disparity than predicted by richness in terms of, of shape. So this is this is the overall picture in terms of okay how do we interpret this data now in light of the evolutionary and biogeographical history of sigma modantins in particular so how diversity accumulated from the beginning from like 10 million years ago to today in the case of sigma modantins you have the kind of two contrasting hypotheses the first to be proposed uh, was these which asserted that the Andes are the main regions of diversification for, for the principal tribes of Sigma teams. So each color here in both these graphs represents a different tribe okay, of Sigma teams. And most are supposed to be concentrated in the Andes because we have more diversity, so these areas of original diverse, differentiation of rate. And then more recent evidence suggests that at least for some tribes, at least for some tribes, the areas of original differentiation or centers of diversification are more close to the east of South America. Uh, we have, for instance, here in, in the right, the, this map of B it is one of the principal tribes of Sigma Montines, and one of the most uh, richest tribes, which is a Codontini. And you have a strong peak of richness here in the Atlantic Forest and here in Central Andes. And this is like the dominant trip in the Atlantic forest, which is relevant for, for these results I, I showed you about the Atlantic forest having higher disparity. And for others, so this is another principal trip, this is Orizomini, 
uh, we got a lot of diversity in the Andes, in northern and the uh, and the regions, and in in the Amazonia, and a few also entering in the Atlantic forest here. So that's how diversity accumulates. Uh, and then we have so this mainly Amazonian group and this mainly Atlantic forest group here, the the Acorantins, or or at least with high richness in the Atlantic forest. And then we can start to put together like a, a picture of their events of diversification and accumulation of disparity. So in the case of diversity per se, in the case of accumulation of diversity, there, there are evidence suggestions that allopatric scattering was really important. Dispersion events for some tribes like Arizona are really important in the accumulation of diversity. And you have, when you have like allopatric speciation, you may not have uh, biggest difference in terms of phenotype, right? So we can have species more or less similar to each other. Uh, this is evidence for low ecological speciation from, from a past uh, paper where you look at for associations in a macroevolutionary scale, in this case, not biogeographic explicitly, of shape and size with diet and life mode, and we find very few. So most of the, the, the this speciation may be associated with, with allopatry, with field morphological diversification. Although we, have, although we have association of diversification with long, lowlands, and in the case of Acodontini, at least this trip from Atlantic Forest, we have climate as important for diversification. And then so in terms of disparity, what I show is high, it's high, I guess, at, at least in Atlantic Forest, then compared to most of South America. And in the macroevolutionary scale, low association between disparity and diet life habitat, low association between morphological disparity and locomotor specialization. These is for uh, humerus, for scapula, and for other post cranial uh, morphological characteristics. But except for Acodontini, where we do have, so the Zacodontinis, which occur in the East Coast of South America, they have some recent evidence for ecological conversions. For instance, they have uh, a new thing, which are the insectivorous rodents. And so evidence for, for diversion selection seems to be strong in Acodontini, which makes sense in light of our, our geographic data here, because it's higher precisely in East, in Atlantic forests of South America, where this tree reaches their peak of, of richness. So uh, that's more or less our, our conclusion here. So the Andes have high species diversity, the highest species diversity, but however, they have relatively low morphological disparity compared to other regions, which may suggest uh, various events of allopatric speciation with field morphological di differentiation accompanying uh, this, uh, this speciation. On the other hand, the Atlantic forest, the east coast of South America, have high species diversity, so the second peak of diversity after the Andes, and still they have high morphological disparity, which may suggest that diversion selection is perhaps more important there in the Atlantic forest than in the Andes. And OK, you should look, of course, to more closely to explicit associations between disparity and diversification, geographically disparity for other groups of rodents, other groups of, of mammals and, and others. Do, disparity of different aspects of morphology are showing only school size. I didn't even show mandible disparity, I didn't do that yet, or even postcranial, or even other aspects of the phenotype. And we don't know precisely what are the, how BS is impact. Like I said, use the geographical range maps, perhaps if you use point locations, you could get something different. Taxonomy and phylogeny is there are always changing. We should look more closely at the taxonomic and phylogenetic source of uncertainty here as well. So that's it. That's basically the, the general idea what I, I had to show. Uh, I thank you. Uh, you at the Institut de Systematique Evolution et Biodiversité 
for for inviting me today. Uh, people who are the co-authors of these papers, I, I, I show it here, including my past advisor and people working with me today in Brazil. And that's it. Thank you. And I wait for it for the for the questions and, and comments. Hey, thank you very much for this incredible presentation. You know, um, so do we have any questions from the audience? Well, while we wait to see if anyone has questions, I have a few of my own. Um, first, um, you you talked a little bit about how the differences in shape were structured um, according to some environmental variables, but you also said um, uh, that phylogeny could play a role and that in the end you decided, you, you got to the conclusion that both were important, but it didn't go into much detail of like um, wh how did you assess the, the role of phylogeny into into this and so on. So if you can explain a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, so uh, the type of analysis we did, so we got, uh, uh, we calculate the principal components of uh, phylogenetic structure across the space. So since we have, we had a matrix of phylogenetic distance between the species, we could, uh, what we did was, uh, so what this, this thing, this PCPS does is multiply these metrics of distance by this occurrence of species, so this presence and absence metrics. So we got these metrics of phylogenetic decomposition. So in a regular composition matrix, you got species are as rows, and then you got sites as columns. And now we have sites as columns, but we have these nodes as rows instead of species. So that way, uh, it's more or less similar to a composition matrix, if you will, mm -hmm. because you know at this scale, large groups are, are really different. But there is a, there is nodes there, so yeah. of course, a bit this phylogenetic relationship. But you could imagine this as a regular composition matrix. You would get more or less similar results in terms of these three occurs mainly on Amazon, and these others mainly on on the South of South America. So we had this big matrix, and then we did a PCOA on it, and then we struck these components of composition variation. And these components, use as, we use that as predictors. So our response variable, response variable in the model, was the average shape. One of the prediction, the predictions were the environmental variables, and the other were these axes of phylogenetic composition across space. So we did a mm -hmm. variation partitioning analysis. That's what we did. And the shared component was the most strong. So the shared between environmental variables and this phylogenetic composition. And from that analysis that came is my conclusion. Uh, well, it's both. We cannot really separate the, the influence. I see. Interesting. Uh, I w also wanted to make sure to mention, um, before I forget, that uh, we are having a happy hour with Henan uh, today at um, 6 p.m. or 18 hours at um, Café Jussieu. Uh, that way, if you're interested in posing more questions or discussing uh, the methods or objectives of his research in more detail, we'll be there. It's our um, new initiative here in the seminars because um, we know lots of people miss the in-person uh, interaction of the seminars but at the same time having the seminars online allows us to show uh the research to a lot of people who might not be on site on those days so we're trying to combine the best of both worlds here and and have um and have the speaker come to a happy hour with us today 6 p.m uh yeah. are there any more questions from the audience <coughs> All right, let me just ask one more thing. Um, so, Heno, uh, you were also talking about the, the diversity. You plotted this nice map with the differences in diversity across different regions, and you concluded that the Andes and the Atlantic forest are um, like the sort of like hotspots of diversity. How much of that do you think might be due to just sampling bias, especially within Brazil, for example, because the Atlantic forest is much more well sampled than other areas, for example, the Amazon and so on? Yeah, uh, 
I usually think that for this big scale pattern, that doesn't make a lot of difference. Why is that? Because you have and these regions which are poorly abstract, like poorly mm -hmm. sampled as well, and we still have high richness there. Uh, and you have like this this kind of pattern for for many 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 years centers, I would say. So people knew it. I'm not talking about crazy new things in terms of this diversity here. That first patterns. I'm just showing it in a map. But folks more or less agree that that's the case for Sigma teams before we even are were able to construct fence maps like that. So this accumulation of, of information from, from many decades, plus these things like, well, we do have uh, more sampling in Atlantic Forest and less in other regions, but we also have poorly sampling in, in many Andes regions, and yet we got like very, very big disparity there. So that gives gives me confidence that this general pattern is true. But of course, we could have like smaller perhaps change, but perhaps significant change if you sample more uh, inside the Amazonian, for, for example. We have like many species being described, despite it's a mammal group, uh, yet we got like the taxonomic revision constantly and the diversity is, in, is increasing. In, in South America in general for this rodent. So yeah, we, we, we may see change in the future uh, in this pattern. All right, great. Thank you very much. So if thank we you. have no other questions, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. That's with the source is great. We'll upload it on YouTube as soon as possible and we'll let you know. Thank you again. Um, and you. Uh, yeah, thanks and goodbye to everyone. Yeah, thank you. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. See, bye. See ya. Bye-bye.